this is Missy Hyatt, The Walking Riot, and I say that you need to save with Conrad. Jim Ross told me, you need to go with Conrad, he'll save you money. <laughs> and he did. You guys helped me out great. And when I refinanced it and paid off everything, I think my payment was only $8 more a month. I probably saved at least over $30,000. They make everything so easy for you. Go to Save with Conrad if you want to refi your mortgage or anything with your mortgage. Just go to Save with Conrad. Hey guys, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Need to call a timeout real quick here. I wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my world listeners for a while now. It's about all the incredible things happening over on adfreeshows.com. We're kicking off 2023 with an all new edition of Title Chase as Conrad dives into the moments, memories, and matches of the 10 pounds of silver, the NWA US Heavyweight Championship. Man, I am doing great. Uh, like my friend Steve Kern likes to say, gratitude is the attitude, and that's where I'm at. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, I had a blast talking about the old WCW Heavyweight Championship with you recently, and we thought, hey, let's uh, let's get down a rabbit hole about something maybe a little more old school. Tell everybody what you're holding there. I am holding the 10 pounds of silver NWA United States Heavyweight Championship belt. We get a peek behind the curtain on an all-new edition of The Insiders as Conrad sits down with former WWE writer and current Impact producer Jimmy Jacobs. You start to realize that you're one weird interaction with events away from being in the doghouse or being fired. Wow. And then you just start to behave in a way to try to not get fired. And then your ideas become ideas in an effort to not get fired. And pretty soon you have a whole bunch of people that are playing to not lose. No spray tans necessary on our latest premium watch along event as Eric Bischoff and Nick Patrick sat down for the first time ever to discuss what really happened in one of the biggest and most infamous main events in history, Starcade 97. It's been 25 years since it happened and this is the first time that we've ever talked about it. nobody came to me that night after the match in the locker room on the at the tv the next day you know it was just we we, we just moved on from it you know and uh, uh but uh, i i did what i was supposed to do out of, out, out of the deal you know i don't know what was told in the production meeting what people were expecting and you know i was getting pulled i was getting pulled from from two different sides. Hey, that's just a small taste of what Ad Free Shows has waiting for you, including a brand new perk, getting to join in on the live recordings of the shows with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. That's right. Sign up today at adfreeshows.com. We'll break down Kevin Nash and Triple H in a cell and you being the referee. But but first, I want to ask uh, about what Dave wrote here. He writes, Foley at first was coming in just for the pay-per-view and two TVs with the idea of plugging his book on the second TV appearance. He had such good timing returning that he immediately agreed to work uh, with the house shows as a referee as well. Originally, he was to do the June 16th Raw, but also added the 23rd since it's MSG. And now there's a good chance he'll appear from time to time on TV going forward because he enjoyed his return. The idea from the company standpoint is for him to wrestle later in the year, coming out of retirement at this point for a street fight style match with Randy Orton. The idea is they're going to try to make Orton into another rock level superstar. If you go with the idea, they have to try it with someone. He's not a bad guy to try with. Of course, the odds are great. He can't be the rock because few guys in history can. Orton didn't have the presence to be a star at that level before a crowd last week, but with a new video entrance linked with Flair and Triple H and the Mega Push, particularly the interaction with Foley on Raw, it did seem to be changing fast. It's funny because that same link and same interaction with Foley would have made half the guys on the roster. Orton isn't a bad choice because he's 21 or 22 and barring injury should be a huge star as he picked things up fast in OVW. But this is why when I hear people say that 
you have to get yourself over and the company can't book you to become a star and that there are guys, there are nothing the guys complaints about not getting a push, boy, that's a load. While natural charisma plays a part, fans reactions are based on how the company presents you. This company killed Goldberg. They can make Orton. It's not 100% and ability, verbal ability and charisma play a part, but company presentation overrides all of that. The plan for Orton is to work with and go over Shawn Michaels, I'm guessing SummerSlam, and for Michaels to establish him as a great wrestler. The idea would then be his next program would be with Foley, with the idea that Foley can put him over and make the fans take Orton seriously as a brawler. And then given his work in helping make Kane, Rock, and, Underta and Triple H into bigger stars, they're kind of giving The Undertaker a career rebirth when he was on the verge of getting stale. Foley himself has talked about wrestling one more match if he can get into shape, but he talks about it as if it was WrestleMania. Still, he's on TV, clearly positioning himself for a match with Orton. So how did the Orton thing come to be? Well, this is at a time when I could have a phone call with Vince and be in his office the next day pitching it. I was one of only like three or four guys who wasn't in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Taker was in Austin, Texas, right? Kane was in Knoxville, but basically, you know, there's two or three guys in the Northeast. So I'm only 90 minutes with traffic away from WWE. The first time I went in to meet with Mr. McMahon, I could literally see the smokestacks from Port Jefferson, which is the town next to the one I grew up in. So that was something we had in common. Um, and so I could make the phone call, say I want to pitch something, and it would be just him or just him and JR. Or at a certain point, it became him and John Laurinaitis. So I know it's Vince. I can't tell you for a fact if, Vince, if JR's there or John's there at that point. Um, he's okay, what you got, pal? I said, Vince, uh, I'd like to enter the Royal Rumble and win it. And because I am neither a Raw or SmackDown guy, I would like to challenge both champions into a three-way dance to unify the WWE title and win that as well. And he looked at me and said, Mick, I have no interest whatsoever in doing that. I said, okay, I've got this idea for Randy Orton. And so Vince had this yellow legal pad and I start giving him ideas. And the, it centers around walking away from a match, having a crisis in confidence, which I had never seen in wrestling, uh, but we do have in real life. Rick Flair. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I had a crisis in confidence that day for sure, and um, and I and I started saying, and once I leave, Randy will try to goad me back in with like political attack ads, and I guess political attack ads were not as uh, omnipresent as they are now. Right. But he said uh, attack ads. I said, yeah, everyone hates those ads. Like Mick Foley claims to be the hardcore legend. Yeah. But is he really? And he starts writing all this stuff down. And at the, at the proper time, we make plans uh, to do this match that I will walk out on uh, with Randy, something that's never been seen before. And then he will goad me back out of retirement. Taking a little page from Rocky II, where Rocky was retired. Apollo wants him back, and he's got the you know, Apollo uh, Apollo Creed versus the Italian Chicken, and and then the guys at the gym were da down on Rocky. He was carrying spit buckets, and then it's like, you know, uh, he comes back to Mickey, who at first has forbid him from f fighting because of his uh, damage to his eye, and then Mickey says, "I say we knock his block off," and then thus begins, you know, the the road to uh, redemption for Rocky. But for me, I'm going to just flat out refused to wrestle. But the night before we pulled the trigger on that angle, Stephanie calls me and says, Mick, we're, we're going to go a different way. I said, uh, what different way? And she says, we're going to have Evolution jump you. I said, what happened to me backing out of the match? She said, my dad doesn't think the fans will ever forgive you. Mm. I said, I said, let me, let me talk to your dad. So I call him up. And he recites with Steph, yeah, Mick, you just worked so hard. I'd hate for you to go out this way. The last people think, I just don't think they're going to forgive you. I said, Vince, I'd heard he was a Western enthusiast. I said, have you seen the movie Shane? He goes, oh, yeah. I said, go back and watch it and tell me how good that movie would have been if Shane accepts 
the challenge the first time because it's all about find that movie is all about this former gunfighter rediscovering finding that dark place in his soul that he's tried to hide for so long if he just if they just said Shane you gutless coward all right and now we're 30 minutes in and we've got no movie and he said he's going to trust my judgment he disagreed with me he thought there was a good chance it would ruin my career but that if i felt that strongly about it he would let me do it my way and then the big challenge became trying to talk Randy into hocking a loogie on me. Uh, he later became really adept at it, right? <laughs> but that first time, he's like, ah, oh, man, I, uh, Mick, I got, you know, I was like, Randy, you have to do it. And I think he said something about it like that. Couldn't I just, I said, we got to be able to see it. If you don't, if we can't see it, it's not as nearly as meaningful. And he was like, oh, I, he he was so against it because he didn't want to be that disrespectful. Right. And I said, Dude, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And what was so fun was to be part of that whole building process. Because in the, I guess I'll do the loogie first and then we'll talk about more of the building process, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, we get in there and this is where I, I borrow a little bit from uh, the original Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds when Burt is contemplating putting the jersey back on and uh, leading the mean machine. And he asks an inmate who had been, I think, a former football player, and he was a lifer because he'd taken a swing at a guard. And Burt says, was it worth it? And he says, yeah, to me it was. So we have, <laughs> I'm in the role of Burt Reynolds, Shawn Michaels in the role of this grizzled uh, lifer, and I'm asking Sean about coming back, I think it was the, the year before uh, against Triple H. And we do that, it, was it worth it? And he goes, to me it was. And then I, real dramatically, I say, get me my flannel. <laughs> <So> <laughs> get me my flannel. And Brian I, loved that line. I, I, did he? <laughs> I'm sure he had to. That's, that feels like he would have written that. Ah, uh, that, that's a Foley one right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and so sh here we go. Push comes to shove. I've got an expert in Vince saying it's going to be the death knell to my career. I feel in my heart like the fans. Uh, I have accrued enough goodwill for them to take a wait and see attitude. I come out, you know, it's for the IC title, which I never won. I do the slow lap around the ring, and then I just keep on walking up that aisle. And now we're live, you know, when Randy confronts me, and I can't remember the exact verbiage, but well, you're walking away, you're nothing but a, a coward. And then just as I had urged him to do, he, he dug down deep as far into his lungs as he could, Got something with a yellowish, yellowish green tinge to it, and he hocked that loogie right on my face. And you could feel the fans, they want me to respond. You know, they really want me to. I don't know if we've ever had a loogie of that magnitude, you know, that uh, I'm sure, well, other than the one that the Brett hocked up on Vince. Uh, but but that, that scene is still so memorable. I can describe it in my mind. I remember it. I mean, I didn't just watch it this week for prep. I think all of us remember that because it did cross the line a little bit of what's allowed in wrestling and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was beautiful about it, one of the things, I think this may have been the best thing I was involved with over uh, as far as one of my ideas being played out, is that when I left, that was a December 10th, somewhere around that area, early December, maybe December 3rd, uh, Randy basically had six, seven weeks to build uh, to build up for my return. And that's when those uh, political attack ads started airing. And not only did they do what I asked, they like went over what I would have thought possible. You know, and it was like, I think they concluded with going, the truth is Mick Foley is nothing more than a little bitch. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I, uh, I did come back at the rumble. Um, I think I had to, uh, uh, I think I had to eliminate test backstage to get a spot. And then I told Randy, I said, man, we've got so much realism in this, uh, 
angle. So when you and I exchange punches, let's really bring him in there. He's like, look at him. I said, yeah, make him real, man. People can tell the difference. And the thing about it, Conrad, is when we got out there, we were swinging for the fences. Nobody really could tell the difference. They look like crappy working punches, what they look like. And also, despite the fact that I've been training at that time for like four months, and I dropped, I think I dropped about 40 pounds at that time. I would go on to, I would go from 330 to 70. And I worked a total of like six months by the time I uh, worked to transform myself for a total of six months by the time, um, by the time that WrestleMania match took place. But even given that, I was blown up within 30 seconds. <laughs> I, within 30, because there's nothing like it, you know? It's right. one thing to be on a, a treadmill or a bike. Uh, it's another thing to be in there with the crowd and the nerves. So, uh, you know, despite the fact nobody could tell that the punches were real, and if anything looked worse than the working punches, it was uh, it was intense, and it got us to that next level. I don't know when we'll talk about it again, so I want to bring it up now. Creatively, what were the plans as far as you heard about Terry Gordy coming in as the executioner? Because when he helps you in October at the yeah. pay-per-view and makes yeah. the debut, it feels like he's going to be a part of this gang with you and Paul Bear. We know it didn't work out. Um, and longtime fans know that as the story goes, Gordy wasn't Gordy anymore by that point. No. But had it gone well, what would it have looked like? Well, I, I, this is what I, I read back at the time, that Terry had gone into ECW and had a nice little run where for at least one night with the Ravens' help, Gordy looked like the Gordy of old. Yeah. And Michael Hayes, oh, man, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone... Uh, more loyal to his friends. I uh, agree, his totally. buddy, buddy Jack. Um, Roberts, you know, even after Buddy lost his voice, he had to speak through the uh, the pipe or the straw, whatever it might be. And then Terry Gordy was one of the great wrestlers. I remember uh, Shane Douglas telling me he was on a tour of all Japan, and he couldn't tell you whether the matches that Gordy was having with Tenru were, were real or not, because the feeling was so believable. Wow. You, you'd see a few things in there and say, okay, that couldn't happen. And there, and there was no UFC at that time yeah. to base it off of. I'm not talking about 97. I'm talking about 93, 94, when Shane, when Gordy was at his peak. I might be off by a year or two. Um, but then he overdosed on a plane to Japan. He was never the same. So I worked with Terry uh, I saw Terry work a number of times because he went from being in all Japan to IWA Japan. And as proud as I was to have helped put that little promotion on the map, there's a world of difference between IWA Japan and all Japan. And now Terry, who is, he is a, uh, mentally never the same, but physically. He looks the same. And even better. He was like a machine when it came to doing those step ups. That you know, that was his thing. And I always appreciated that Terry and Dr. Death Steve Williams were nice to me on my tour in ninety one when they didn't have to be. And Gordy even gave me like a set of uh, little mini speakers you could plug into your Walkman, which is a big freaking deal. Yeah. Not just to get the speakers, but to get them from Terry Gordy. But when he got to um, WWF you know, that Gordy of old, I knew, I knew that, you know, I knew Terry wasn't the same. Uh, you know, when, when we did the King of the Death match, uh, press conference, uh, I had, I had heard about rotten Ron Starr breaking bottles over his head in, uh, in 88 or 89 in continental, uh, when I worked with him and I put that in the back of my mind as something I'd like to do. So at that press conference, I believe I smashed a bottle over my head, cut a promo on Gordy, talk, acknowledging that he was one of the greats of all time, but telling about, you know, how are you going to feel when there's 10,000 thumbtacks in the middle of that ring? And then after the press conference, Gord, Terry comes up, he goes, bro, nobody ever told me nothing about no thumbtacks. And so I said, don't worry, Terry, we're going to be okay. And it was just odd that I was the guy walking him through that match. And I'd noticed that the Gordy punches of old, which were just so tremendous. Yes. To me, whenever I imitate a wrestling punch, I'm not talking about the punches I throw, I threw mainly forearms, especially after, you know, 
2000, whenever I came back. I didn't have a lot of faith in my punches anymore. But Gordy had that punch. So I would say, like, all right, you know, this is where we're wrestling. It differs, obviously, from boxing or MMA yeah. in a lot of ways. But your power punches in boxing, and they usually come from – there's a short – Bam! You know, it's boom. It's it's, it's putting a core strength into it, everything you have into a s short punch. Whereas in wrestling, we don't throw it from here to here. We throw it from here, rattle it around, bring it back here, and bam! That's the Gordy punch, which was a thing of beauty. Yeah. But he, I, he specifically had been throwing punches that didn't have that authenticity anymore. And that's where I said, Terry, you've got a great reputation over here. I want to make sure that this is as good as it can be. It was only slated for eight or nine minutes because it was the opening round of the King of the Death match tournament. And I said, just uh, bust, bust my eyebrow. Just it, it hit me, you know, as hard as you can over the eye. And bro, are you sure about that? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And there was, I wanted it to look good for my sake, but I also wanted it to look good for his sake. Because if I'm in a position where I have to sell stuff that doesn't look good, that's not good for me. No. Nope. But I also was very conscious of his legendary status. I knew he was putting me over, which was no small, you know, feat in Japan and no small honor. And I wanted to make sure they look good. But so I knew what I was dealing with when Terry came in. I was surprised by the call. I was happy he got it, and. Uh, it just wasn't, he wasn't the same guy. Yeah. There's that, there's that part of uh, Buried Alive where, uh, and there's a reason why every subsequent Buried Alive match had a backhoe. Yeah. Because it turns out that filling a, you know, a six foot by three foot. Takes forever. It, takes forever, right? And I'm trying to do it at the end of a 20 minute match in October uh, 2000, <laughs> 1996. I'm laughing because I realize I've got a line here that I shouldn't say, that I will not say, um, but I could say. Uh, concern. <laughs> You have to now. You can't tease us. We'll bleep it. <laughs> That's a so their answer instead of a backhoe was to come out. You know, it's to be. I was joined by JBL. I was joined by Gordy. Actually, hit Undertaker. So I yes. lose the match. You know, I'm buried far enough down uh, to where I lose the match, and then Gordy whacks Undertaker over the head. Breaks the, the shovel. shovel. Breaks the shovel. Undertaker drops into the hole, and now we basically have an exhausted mankind, JBL, uh, uh, Triple H. Goldust, too, I think. Goldust comes out there, too. And Gordy, you know, we're tr we've got shovels out there, and Gordy, instead of using the shovel, basically turns around and looks more like a cat in a litter box. Yes. As he's scooping little handfuls. Of, and that's not what you want your executioner. To no, the executioner okay. does not. Right. Katie later. Yeah. All right. And so the line is, uh, is it's the first documented case of Triple H burying WWE. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an oh, it's a horrible thing to it's say. It's a great line. It's a horrible thing to say, especially because he did so much to discover talent. You know, sure. And, but. Uh, oh man, it's I've said that maybe two times, you know, when I've been on the road, and you know it gets a laugh, but it's like, ah, oh, is it worth? Well, we know it's not true. You're right. just having yeah. fun, just having a little fun. Uh, and I remember JBL and I talking. We might have even been riding at that time, and he said there was a father, a father that was watching with his child, and went like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. The whole concept of burying your opponent alive—it's unbelievable. And keep in mind, this is the main event of an In Your House match, which is only a t t t In Your House show. I know where you're going, and I can't wait. Two hours long. And so after the main event, here comes the... When the know, cameras turn off. The cameras turn off. We've just had a bolt of lightning come down from the scoreboard, which is one of my favorite stories. I'll tell it closer to Christmas time. Uh, Undertaker's hand comes up through the grass, right? We go off the air with Jim Ross going, He's alive. He's alive. And then Undertaker's head goes back down with no attempt to rescue the buried Undertaker. Now the the music hits and the new rockers come out. <laughs> for their, their, they just run past the grave. Yeah, there's no rescue attempt. Like it wouldn't have been great if they actually pulled Undertaker out of there for the sake of the fifteen, whatever it was, twelve to fifteen thousand fans in the 
attendance. Uh, I, because I believe we sold that son of a bitch out. So we saw a man die, but now here's Al Snow. <laughs> here's Al Snow. Yeah. Yes. And they're going to take on the Bushwhackers. Yeah. So that's one of your uh, that's one of your dark matches. Uh, but that's a situation we're in. Gordy is not the Gordy of old. It's just not working out like it was supposed to. Were you guys yeah. supposed to be a tag team? I yeah yeah. I mean, it was supposed to be part of that new faction. Um, and we how did, cool would that have been? Ah, it would it would have been great. You know, as far back as ninety uh, one, I'd had a really good match with Terry uh, for Global Wrestling, and that was a big match for me. Like to hang with a guy like that whose style was so realistic. It was part of that process for me of going from a mid card. Kind of, kind of a comedy figure to really being a respectable main event guy. So hanging in with Terry Gordy, you know, for a 20-minute very physical match. I remember Barry Windham remarking on it, saying he watched it. And I said, what, what do you think? He goes, I think there could have been a little more selling. It was a good match, he said. Don't get me wrong. It could have been a, lot, a little more selling. But that was the style that Terry worked. You know, there wasn't a lot of selling going on in all Japan. There was some, believable, uh, but you really had to work to get your guy to sell. So Gordy was one of those guys that, uh, you know, you ha whose respect you had to earn. And if you didn't hang with him, he was going to do what he had to do to make sure that he, you know, he didn't look foolish out there. Well, I wish back then I could have uh, delivered you some AG1 because <laughs> just one delicious scoop and a cup of water every day, that's all you need to optimize your immune system, to get better gut health. Maybe you don't have the time, maybe you want a supplement that actually tastes great. Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. The reason I'm pawing through my bag here is that I've just sworn I had one of those greens. Uh, I, I usually bring the packets when I'm on the road. I try to use it every day. I probably realistically use it four or five times uh, a week, and I really like it. It's tough to get your greens in when you're traveling, and uh, I do like that. So uh, that's a fact. You know, that's me uh, testifying for something I actually do use. Come on now, a little AG1 testimonial. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you're trying to eat keto or paleo or vegan or dairy free or gluten free. There's less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, and it still tastes good. It's going to taste, support. It tastes really good. Yeah, it tastes really good. And for those of you who like, uh, you know, like a meal replacement shake or, uh, you know, the protein shakes, you add it, it actually makes your drink taste better. If, yeah, I don't mix it up with a chocolate blend, but with vanilla, it's really good. It really is. It's going to support better sleep quality and recovery, better mental clarity and alertness. And it costs you less than three bucks a day. And think about how rare it is that any of us go out of our way to leave a review. I mean, it has to be really good or really bad for me to be motivated to do that. Yeah. Well, Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. And right now, Mick and I think it's time to reclaim your health. Arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Foley. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Foley to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So uh, we find ourselves in a tag match here for you uh, at WrestleMania. Um, some creative ideas are floated around, and Jim Cornette gives you a call, and you wrote this in your book. I received a phone call at home from Jim Cornette. He was all excited. Cactus, he said, in his high-pitched Louisville lingo. I know you haven't been in the mix that much, but dadgum, I think we've got something for you. What is it, Corny? Well, Cactus, we're thinking of doing a little something where Mark Merrow and Rena continue their little spat, and you don't like it, so you deck Mark. You want Rena with your little group, but Uncle Paul doesn't like it, so you deck Paul. Now, Paul still doesn't like Rena, but he knows he has to tolerate her for your sake, and the three of you will have your own little strange family. So I'll just stop right there. But at this point, you had to hate every bit of this, right? I did. Yeah. I did. Um... 
And uh, I want to. I don't want to make my words so lukewarm that uh, you know we stink up the place here. Uh, but I also want to preface what I'm about to say by saying Mark Merrow is one of the great ex wrestlers of all time. Meaning what he does, talking to oh, know, yeah. schools, he's phenomenal. But that the wild man character wasn't. It's a miss. It was a miss. And what added fuel to the fire? I'm talking about the fire in my gut, and I think yeah. I could speak for Steve Austin. Uh, also, at this time, uh, Mark had come in just shortly after Steve, and only days after I came in. And whereas I signed for uh, an opportunity, Mark got a guaranteed contract and a pretty sizable one. And that, oh man, it, it fueled me in a positive way. But it was, you know, this negativity that we fed off of and channeled it in positive ways. So I, I did not want to be in an angle with Mark because I just didn't. I thought my character connected with a lot of different characters, uh, and they didn't have to. They, I mean, it could be straight, you know, like straight men, you know, wrestlers. I work really well with a guy like Bret Hart. Uh, war character driven uh, wrestlers. I didn't feel like I could do something solid with Mark. And I should have, and you know, looking back on it now, Rena was really on the rise at that yes. time as Sable. And she would go on to be a veritable superstar. That could have been really interesting. But I think I, I know that before, um, before um, my Mind Games match with Sean, uh, originally, I was supposed to be slotted in for a match with Mark, and the company really was behind him at that time. You know, I mean, Vince had pressure to make the investment, the investment work. Look, yeah. look like it was a, a, a good one, uh, and I didn't want to be. I wasn't excited about it. I wasn't in a position where I could say no. But I don't know what changed behind the scenes where I went from singles with Mark Merrow to a singles with Shawn Michaels, but that worked out to my favor. Yeah, hell yeah. And again, just Mark Merrow. He's a and I personally apologized to him for, you know, for taking shots at him over the years. And it was purely out of financial jealousy, as is, you know, something, I, anything I would have said about Rena, you know, in the years later was purely out of jealousy. Part of it, you know, financial and part of it, you know, going to autograph shows where her line would be five times what mine was. It hurt, you know, it hurts guys like me. Uh, but she was a veritable superstar on the rise, and that could have been a good angle. But I did not want to be part. I get a, I get a sinking feeling, you know. Like I'm a gut player too. When your heart sinks into your stomach, that's a sign that something's not right about it. You know, I could be elated after a talk with. Uh, and Corny's a good salesman, right? Yeah, hell yeah. And Corny was often the the bearer of bad news when it came to. He was the guy who would deliver the news to me. He was the guy who told me after I did these vignettes as Mankind that were a big hit with everyone except Vince. Yeah. And I said, but Jimmy, uh, Vince said he loved my promos. And he hesitated and said, Cactus, I'm not sure Vince has ever seen one of your promos, which was still strange to me. And I know we've talked about that in the past. We feel like a guy who micromanages everything would take that extra 10 minutes to look at a highlight tape or maybe yeah. even an hour. If yeah. this guy's going to be one of the, you know, backbones of the company, maybe you should take that hour to watch a few promos, a few matches, and really get a better grasp on what you have. But Vince is a gut player. What he sees on that 13-inch monitor, the first time you walk into his ring, is what your, your future is based on. Talking about Mero for a minute, did you have any interaction with him in WCW? I mean, you guys were there for a yeah, long time. Yeah, we were there, time. and we were good friends. Uh, I remember Mark and Rena would be at uh, Sting's gym, Sting and Luger had main event fitness, Mark and Rena coming to Dewey's birthday party. Uh, so I consider Mark a, Mark a good friend. Uh, and I and what he was dealing with Johnny B. Bad was tremendous. And he also showed that he can then make himself a valuable commodity. You know, rumor had it that Jane Fonda saw uh, some of the great work that Mark was doing on his own, speaking to groups of kids. It's always been something in his heart. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and that was part of the reason why he ended up with a, such a great contract in WCW. So no question that that was a great fit. Here's a, <laughs> a Jewish kid from upstate New York playing a black man from Macon, Georgia. Yes. And somehow making it work. 
I remember saying to a, there was a guy named Frank Polera who was a huge boxing enthusiast who uh, who went to college with me in Cortland, New York. And uh, and Mark Mar Mark Marrow had knocked out one of his guys. Uh, maybe he defeated Razor Ruddock. Uh, he he'd beaten somebody who was a really big deal in professional boxing. And I said, yeah, Mark Marrow, uh, he beat Razor Ruddock. And and uh, and he goes, but Mark but Marrow's a white guy. He didn't know Mark Marrow was Johnny B. Bad. And so when I told him that the guy playing Johnny B. Bad had beaten Razor Ruddock, he said Marrow's a white guy. So. Mark spent so much time in that tanning bed that yeah. he accurately portrayed a flamboyant black man. Uh, did it very well uh, to the point where Vince became a big fan of that character and he was really rolling. But I didn't have anything, to, I didn't, I don't even know if we had a match. Don't even know if we had a match when I was in WCW. But I mean, he's coming to your kid's birthday party. Yeah, so yeah. you're. Uh, "Quote unquote heat with him is really with the company that it's they really believe the in in him more than they believed in yeah, you." Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that it, it hurt. I remember Steve and I, uh, Austin and I, commiserating over it, uh, but it was a positive. You know, I don't know if I could have reached the heights I did without that little kick in the butt. How much of that really came down to leverage, too? In that, you know, you didn't jump right from WCW right. to the WWF and nor did Steve. Yeah. So maybe they felt like, well, Hey, he'll take it. Or, you know, as JR likes to say, go shop your resume. Yeah. Whereas when Mero comes, he created a little bit of a low key bidding war between both sides. Yeah. And he did keep in mind what I had uh, going on was I was working for ECW. Yes. Um, doing some good stuff there. I was in IWA Japan pulling down three grand a week, which is really three grand for 10 days because there are three days of travel, and coming home in really rough shape. Burn up. Burn up, yeah, especially in August. But even before then, coming home with the wounds that I, I said a doctor, you know, described as looking like I'd been part of a prison break or saying he'd only heard about injuries like these uh, in prison breaks. And even when... W, even when IWA Japan wanted to keep me there and wanted to put me under contract, they were going to bump me up by 500 a week. So you'd be looking at 10 tours a year for $3,500. Not great money no. considering what you're doing to earn it. And so this isn't a case where, you know, you've got a, a Hanson or Brody contract in all Japan and you can make your living there in 20 weeks and then kind of take it easy, take some indies, do whatever you want to do. Stan later went on to be part of WCW, you know, on I think on a thousand dollar a night guarantee. Uh, but got big guys like that who worked a really physical style usually had time to recuperate. Whereas yeah. I would come home, my wife, I may remember one night my wife met me at JFK with the kids. We drove to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. The kids were sleeping. So I went in, did my match with Sandman uh, at the same arena that New Jack tried to throw Taz over the, through the window, like out onto a fifty foot, you know, a fifty foot drop. And this was Taz in a neck brace after breaking his neck. Um, but I, I mean, I was back from Japan and on the road every, uh, just about every single weekend. You know, you had to make uh, hey, what was it? Hey, while the sun shines. There you go. There you go. Hey, you're a southern you man. So yeah. you work uh, Bret Hart for Shotgun Saturday Night at Webster Hall in New York City. And I can't believe this is real, but I think this is the only time you're ever in a one-on-one -on -one match with him on TV. On TV, yep. I think I only had two singles matches with Bret. One Shotgun Saturday Night, and the other one was uh, House Show Matches. Is one of two matches, House Show Matches, I wish I had on tape because they felt magical when they're taking place. The other one was one with Shawn Michaels at uh, Madison Square Garden, where we just tore the house down. Uh, but Brett really liked the Mankind character. I remember when he, uh, he and I got together, he asked what I'd like to do. I said, Brett, you know, this is supposed to have a really gritty feel. At that time, that's what Shotgun Saturday Night was. A raw originally was supposed to be raw because it's rough around the edges. And then with WCW applying that type of pressure, that quickly, you know, um, you know, became secondary or, or even eliminated completely. Where Raw became the state of the art, you know, ultra slick uh, uh, production. 
But at that time, Shotgun Saturday Night was supposed to look really rough around the I office. loved it. And I said, Brad, I, I think we should just go out there and call it in the ring. And there may have even been one botch in that I occasionally would not know which way to go on a neck breaker. Uh, to this day, I don't know how guys and women know how, because there were a couple, that was like my botch. I, I did the same thing with Jerry Lawler at uh, one of the King of the Ring tournaments. Um, but I think so there was one mistake and it wasn't what you'd say was an all time classic, but it was really a good solid match that I really enjoyed. And it really felt like we accomplished something special because not a word of it, you know, not a move had been thought of beforehand. So it's hard to compare and contrast that with your mind games match with Sean because you guys did lay yeah, that one yeah, out. Yeah. Um, and I'm not asking you to say, hey, who was a better opponent? And, and I know a lot of fans want to have the Mount Rushmore discussion. I'm not looking mm -hmm. for that. But on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, most of our listeners think Bret Hart was a 10 out of 10 in the ring. Because yeah. his stuff even today still stands up. And there's, yeah. you're able to suspend disbelief, yeah. if that's the right phrase. Would you agree in the ring, Bret's oh, a yeah. 10? Oh, Bret was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And he had such a... a wide variety of great matches with a wide variety of opponents yes. so he could have the great match with a character you know character driven performer like undertaker even before character taker became more uh uh match oriented you know yeah. and i think that was about the time that he and i uh got together he told me he wanted to start trying more things that took him a little out of that character but somehow felt safely inside it if that makes any yes. sense he made it work for the character uh but he wanted to expand what he could do but going back to brett he would have a great match with the consummate technician he would have a great match with the brawlers and all of his stuff looked great and and he he referred to his punches as being the rubber mallets because he laid that stuff in you know like uh he was a very believable worker who had great matches with everyone and was, a, you know, the guy, the kind of the glue that helped them, held WWE together uh, when they went a different direction from, from Hogan. Some and, tough times. Yeah, some tough times. Uh, so Monday Night Raw at the Sky Dome, which is a big time show. Yeah. I mean, the idea that, I mean, this is a company a few years prior to this is running events in, in high school gyms. And yeah. now they're at the Sky Dome. Uh, you're going to be teaming with Farouk in the main event to take on The Undertaker and Ahmed Johnson. It's a no holds barred match. Taker's going to get the win after Vader's interference backfires. And I guess it has to be said, you're not getting a lot of wins on TV here. <laughs> uh, we talked about the Godwins. It was a double count out. Yeah. And now... You know, not winning here either. Are you concerned that maybe Vince is losing confidence in you, or do you think this is a contract thing, or are you even in your head about that? And you're just worried about I got to stay healthy. I think staying healthy was my biggest concern. Uh, it was hard to look down the road when you, you're not sure uh, how long a road you have. Um, I, even if I was losing, I was losing in high profile matches. Yes. And there's a catch 22. You're the guy who can lose. And if not, keep your heat, keep your interest. That was to me, interest was more important than heat always was. And that's one of the arguments that I'll have with, you know, the people who go look for the heat. I always wanted there to be interest. And I felt like the interest was there. But I realized I hadn't, I realized that I hadn't scored a victory in a while. I realized, like I said, that uh, when you can't beat the Godwins, that's yeah, not, not the formation of a super team. And keep in mind, Ahmed and Undertaker, that seems like an odd team. But at that time, Ahmed you know, was over. Ahmed was over. And going back to when Barry Blaustein approached Mr. McMahon about doing this Beyond the Map documentary. And Vince asked who he wanted to focus on. When Barry said me, and this is when I was part of WWE, Vince was really intrigued by that. And uh, Barry said he saw me as being a superstar or future, you know, a superstar all time. And talking about like, you know, uh, foundation of the company. And Vince told him, Ahmed Mark Merrill at that time. So we're talking 96 at that time. But now several months later, you know, Ahmed is still really deeply in that mix and he's super over. He left the company because he wouldn't put Kurgan over, which seems ludicrous 
you know, you're talking about I'm a guy who's losing almost every night. Yeah. On the road, I'm not get I'm not piling up many TV victories, uh, and I'm okay with that. And Ahmed left the company because he didn't want to put over Kurgan in Houston. Uh, Ahmed at the time too. Um, you know, it's hard for us to wrap our head around what it was maybe in hindsight because I know that he doesn't go on to have this huge career. But he was getting huge reactions, yep. a big power guy, and he wasn't necessarily a strong promo or phenomenal in the ring, but he did have a presence about yeah. him, and fans were reacting in a big way for him. So I see why they would they would go with him, but it doesn't feel like he really ever totally embraced wrestling culture, if that's even the right word, because I don't hear a lot of the folks who worked with him say, oh yeah, we rode together, I loved Ahmed. I don't know that he really knew enough about the business. Is that fair to say? I don't know. I don't know, Conrad. I know he came out of uh, Texas and, uh, you know, worked some with uh, whatever reincarnation world class was and caught a lot of attention as Tony Norris. Um, I don't know why they went with Ahmed Johnson, but it was a cool name. Um, Alle was... Allegedly, uh, Buck Johnson is what Bill Watts wanted. Buck Johnson. Okay. Yeah. That got shot down. Okay. Ahmed instead. Ahmed Johnson. I uh, remember Farouk came out of the gate uh, with uh, Farouk with the blue helmet. Yeah. Came out, and uh, Ahmed was on the shelf for a few months after yep. that. I think it was kidney. a kick kidney. Yeah. Kick to the kidney. Not much you can do. Where, you know, it's Mother Nature's going to, you know, uh, is going to put you on hold for a while. It's not something you got your way through. Yeah. So uh, that hurt. Uh, but I think at one time he was he teamed up at a main maybe it was named ninety seven with the Road Warriors. Yeah, and and we're yeah. gonna talk about wrestling in Chicago. 13, yeah, but that was even marketed locally as the co main event. Yeah, not Brett and Austin, but Road Warriors and Ahmed against the Nation was marketed locally as the co main event. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. It really was. Yeah, because Road Warriors, despite not being from Chicago. It's their spiritual home. Uh, right, their spiritual home. Ahmed's big, and I remember that feeling like it was up there with the yeah. top couple matches on the card. I'm curious, you know, just in terms of the timing, you know, there's the old game that we hear about, telephone, telegram, telewrestler. <laughs> yeah. And that summer, we're going to get the big showdown with, with Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Hulk Hogan's coming to WCW. Did you, at this point, had you heard Hogan might be coming in? And did you think, perhaps, that you would be an opponent for him? Because what we had seen in the WWF was Hogan needed a heel factory. Just one big bad guy after another... Uh, from Kamala to a big boss man to whomever. And it felt like the Cactus Jack persona, if it was a heel, could have been a prime candidate for Hogan. That's a great point, Conrad. I don't think I ever once thought that way. I think because by the time Hulk came, I had already given my notice. Right. In my head, it wasn't a matter, it wasn't, it wasn't a heel versus babyface equation. It was Mick Foley equals no future here. Yeah. Um, so when Hulk came in, Kevin Sullivan and I were teaming up. Um, we uh, Max Payne and I had had a heck of a match with the Nasty Boys. Unbelievable. Um, and that was supposed to be my last match before I had that surgery done. And so I actually said something on that. This is where it's a strange thing because you're uh, you're you're in the zone because I'm walking from the uh, I'm to, uh, the name of the hotel will come to me in a second. It was just across the parking lot, the Clarion. The Clarion uh, was just across the parking lot from the the venue, uh, the Allstate Arena, um, which is not in downtown Chicago, but yeah. it's uh, in a suburb. It was right across the parking lot. I was already on edge because I felt like this uh, uh, thing with uh, me and Vader had been dropped prematurely yeah. and my push had been dropped and so I was uh, not so much confronted but approached by a camera crew uh, because Missy Hyatt had filed a claim oh. against WCW mm -hmm. and I said the immortal words kind of in in kind of in character but I said, if you can reach down into Ted's deep pockets, 
go ahead and do something to those words. Basically going, hey, go ahead and get some money out of Ted. And I remember uh, the next day, Eric Bischoff calling me up and asking if I'd said that. I said, yeah, I guess I had. So I was, it was a harsh reprimand. Um, and then I think on that same day, Kevin Sullivan called me up. Uh, he had heard I was leaving to have my ear fixed. And he said, brother, can you put that off a little while? Um, uh, Evad had been injured. Remember that was uh, yeah. uh, Dave Sullivan who uh, had dyslexia, was a big Hogan fan, was teaming up with Kevin, and he wanted to know if I would take uh, Kevin's place to take on the Nasty Boys. And, uh, okay. And so we ended up being pushed and even winning the, w the WCW tag team titles while I was kind of in the doghouse. So it was, like, it didn't bury me by any means, not by any means. Uh, I mean, WCW, it was always going to be a secondary title, but it was a nice run, and it was with Sullivan. I owed a lot to Sullivan because we, he'd done for me in 1990. So I had given my notice, but they pushed me. They pushed me, and I think I said at the show uh, that you were at in Huntsville a couple weeks ago, I was like, they pushed me, but they never once sat me down and asked me to reconsider. Yeah. So if they had ever sat me down and said, hey, look, Hulk's gonna need some opponents. We think a heel Cactus Jack would be a great opponent for Hulk. Uh, we'd like to keep you on for another, you know, for another year. Uh, then I may have uh, taken that ramp, but no one ever sat me down and asked me to reconsider. And uh, so I was, you know, setting up my uh, not my debut with uh, with ECW. I'd done something in conjunction with ECW as part of WCW. Including but, the tag titles, which we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, 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 that's, yeah. Yeah, that was that got me some heat. And that was a good promo, good too. Oh, fantastic. That was a great promo. So when I got all the heat for spitting on the titles, my question to Rick was, did you see the promo? Did you see the promo? Like, in context, it's I'm not burying WCW just because I spit on their title. I, I specifically mentioned how much I love that title, how much it meant to me, but that I'd lost even more that night. And the fact that I lost to Sabu, and I'm saying that and putting him over as strongly as I could because it was told, I was told how important this alliance was. So I was doing what I thought was best for WCW and came across like I was burying WCW, which I was not. I, uh, I just can't help but wonder, you know, the old hypothetical, what would Cactus Jack and Hulk Hogan look like at, I don't know, say Halloween Havoc 94? That could have been something else. Yeah, uh, because Hulk and I are both limited physically. Yeah. But um, as far as getting people involved in his storylines, man, he's got a tra track record that's pretty much second to none. It, it would have been a lot better than the, with the Dungeon of Doom we got. Let's is that what they got? Is that... They got the Dungeon of Doom with Earthquake. Was He thought he was a fish. and Yeah, it was a lot of uh, less yeah, than stuff. If, yeah, if we had done the, the turn and they gave me some mic time, uh, I think it could have been good. I think Hulk and Mick Foley could have been. Am I now I'm talking about myself in third person? <laughs> I think Hulk and I could have, uh, could have had a good match in TNA if I hadn't left there. Yeah. Early and I, I've uh, when I'm asked about Hulk, I'll say two types of people in the world: the type of person who's going to pretend it's not a big deal to be in the ring with him, and the type of person who's going to acknowledge that it is a big deal to be in the ring with him. And when I saw we had chemistry in the ring, I thought oh, we could have done him. We could have done a match. Not saying it would have been explosive. Not saying it would have ranked high up there on the five star meter. But in '94, uh, yeah, '94. Nine, I'm talking about oh, 2010. Yeah. But in '94, oh yeah, yeah, we could have we we could have burned it down in '94, sure. Yeah. So let's talk about this match. Uh, more modern times here, Super Brawl. Uh, you you sort of laid out that maybe the Nasties were upset with Max Payne. Does <laughs> they go back through the curtain and it's a shouting match? No, she probably should have been. Uh, because I know that Sags felt like it might have been intentional, like it might have been intentional, and they ribbed Max because Max was a big, good-hearted guy, and the Nasties were ribbers. 
you know, I mean, they took it well, and you know, I mean, Sags got as good as he. Knobs, uh, Knobs was more of the the verbal ripper. Uh, he got it as good as he gave it, and he enjoyed being in that role. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the things I wrote about in my book, the Tower New York Times number one bestseller, "Have a Nice Day," is that uh, we take the uh, the test, you know, for testing uh, for drug test. And Nobbs, who was probably surprised that the plastic cup didn't melt when his uh, you know, urine hit it, <laughs> ends up testing positive, and he goes, oh, okay, what'd you get me for? And the guy goes, uh, anabolic steroids. And Nobbs just says right in front of the doctor, steroids? Steroids? And he takes off his shirt, and like he, you know, Arn Anderson says, he got the physiological makeup of a jellyfish. He goes, does it look like I'm on steroids? And the doctor takes his pen and writes, obviously there's been some type of mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Nasty Boys always strike me as a type, and I know they had their issues with Scott Hall when you weren't yeah, there and all that, yeah. but they always strike me as like old school guys where even if you did maybe take a liberty or something didn't go right, they're just going to stick their hand out and say, good match. And dot 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 i'll catch you down the road they came up through that uh awa system you know which was that incredibly taxing uh training yeah regimen and so they went through it i mean they i remember coming and doing my event and while on one hand i sh never should have told the nasties to come and be my guests because that didn't you know they went, kind of went into the business on their own uh and they gave a very interesting talk that would have been a great talk if it was an evening with the Nasty Boys. And I had Kane there as my guest too, and neither one of us got to talk for about 25 minutes, but Sags and Knobs did take me and all the people in attendance through the rigors they had to endure. And they said it was Matt Millen, there was some connection with Matt Millen, the great football player. And Matt Millen was on the phone, whether it was with Vern or whoever the trainer was, Brad Rengans, whoever it was. And he was asking, and they said they saw his eyes like, just going real wide and Matt put down the phone he said you guys have to get in shape like talking about getting in shape before they ever got there so I think they trained for a year or so just to, just to endure what they had to endure with the AWA I had no idea they come out they just look like a couple of brawlers you know they had that what I think Meltzer called a strange charisma yeah you know and they had good matches they they were good characters i mean they had a great whether it was a one-year run in wwe they were great in wwe yes. right yes and they had good matches throughout their time in in wcw um the story about <laughs> dave schultz is uh he is the i don't think it's hyperbole say the most infamous enforcer of all time, or at least at that point he was. Um, the Broadway bullies are just legendary in Philadelphia. Dave Schultz is, he's coaching a, you know, a, a minor league hockey team, I think, in the area. But this is a big deal to have this guy as your enforcer. He's somebody who really means something, especially in Philadelphia. And so uh, I can see him, he's, he's out of his element. He doesn't feel completely comfortable and he goes over to um, I think it's Sags who he's supposed to hit, you know, leading into the finish. And he says, um, maybe you guys can show me how to throw one of your punches. And Sags kind of looks and he goes, nah, just hit me as hard as you can. And he goes, if I hit you as hard as it can, I'm going to hurt you. And he goes, like I said, hit me as hard as you can. And I said, uh, Mr. Schultz, and he said, yes, I said, uh, you are a legend here. We would not want to do anything that makes you look bad in front of this audience. I said, we're going to be out there pretty much swinging away. And so you need to do the same. And at that point, Schultz's <laughs> his nervousness ends. I believe he enjoys a beer or two. He enjoys talking with us. And now when that moment comes down and he has to go to work, on, on SAGs, it is clear that he has fully 
grasped the lesson <laughs> and taken out. <laughs> maybe, maybe above and beyond. He pulls, you know, they always had the shirts, right? Like, you know, we were all, all cover up uh, yeah. aficionados, right? We all believe in the art of the cover up. So he pulls that shirt over, sags his head. And I mean, brother, when he's coming in with the uppercuts, he's hitting them with everything he has. He knocks them goofy. And now I think there's a, you know, whatever move ends it after that comes in rapid succession. But it's Schultz uh, just throwing haymakers and connecting, knocking Sags goofy at his own request. And it's like, oh, I'm so proud to be part of this business, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um... And you now just, I don't know if we're going to revisit this match at another time. But this is my, my only gold that I had on, on that, you know, in WCW was that tag team gold. Yeah. My dad was at the match. Uh, a couple of my friends were at the match. Philadelphia, not too far from Long Island. And I remember Bischoff saying, that's the Mick Foley I want to see, or that's the Cactus Jack I want to see. Because I had been down, you know, I had been down. And um, as we'll probably talk about, you know, I was thinking I was going to get surgery to repair the... the uh, uh, the lost year, and then I got called back into action or asked if I would go back into action. And Kevin and I had that great match with the Nasties, uh, and it was it was it was one for the ages. Trying to live up to what we did at Spring Stampede, yeah. So man. and we we will. There's a lot to live up to, as you and I, I guess, are going to talk about. The Nasty Boys, though, such a guilty pleasure of mine. I love this match. Uh, and you know what? They, they love the fact. I don't think I ever see them when they don't quote the book where they say the Nasties were sloppy and dangerous, but they knew how to brawl. Like they, like they were the guys who would hit you in the rib. You know, they might catch you in the ribs, you know, instead of the stomach, you know. Uh, I guess anything that I, I probably owe <laughs> Nobs an apology to this day for the fact that I took a fan's so bo you know soda bottle, not a bottle, you know, big thirty-two ounce uh, soft drink or beer, and I think I'm throwing beer in Nobs's face, and the, the guy goes, "No, like no," I was like. Come on, dude. It's only beer. You can order another one. And I'm in mid fling when I see this br brown liquid it's tobacco. en route and it's chewing tobacco. And it's like knobs <laughs> looks like the recipient of the worst money shot in the history of adult films if the money shot was brown in color. Just it's just <laughs> it looks like a sn snowman that's melting, you know. Oh. And so to this day, yeah, sorry, my bad on that one. <laughs> wow, well, that's gross. You wrote about this uh, in your uh, book. You're talking about the first Clash of the Champions, I think you were on. Yeah. As much as uh, I wish it weren't true, my first tent in WCW spanning late November 89 through mid-June 90 will best be remembered for my February 10th match at Clash of the Champions. Unfortunately, I hated the match and considered it one of the biggest letdowns of my career. For years, however, it was the most frequently thing talked about of my career, so I'll at least try to touch on it. Uh, do you want to just catch us up to? Yeah, um, yeah. This is where I disagreed with WCW because I think it was uh, it wasn't for Cinco de Mayo. That's in May, but it was Corpus Christi, uh, a strong uh, Hispanic, market. Hispanic market, and they decided to bring in Mil Mascaras. Um, and Corny's the one who breaks that news to you. Corny breaks the news, working. hey, and he thinks it's going to be great. Yes. And I'm like, ooh, man. And I know Mascaras is a certifiable legend, bigger star globally than I, I ever was. But I'd also seen him work in world class, and I felt like he was, he wasn't a giver. You know, that he was going to get in his stuff. At that, at that point, he was older. That's all he really wanted to do. Uh, and I did not know that how to have a good match with him. Like, Al Perez couldn't have a good match. Now it was a heck of a hand. Um, so it was. I Al Perez was, is, uh, for people who don't know, he's Seth Rollins' father, illegitimately. No, just no, yeah, but he looks like him, right? Looks identical. Be, yeah. yeah. But Al was super smooth. He had a great body. Like he was a real great technician. He wouldn't put people over though. Right. And that was really that's the silliness of not. But you're costing yourself a job because you don't want to hurt your job. So you're going to not hurt your job by losing your job yes. because you won't put over the champion. Yes. Just dumb. Dumb to me. And especially, and I was there when guys would walk out of dressing rooms because they did two weeks in Japan. 
and they wouldn't want to lose because uh, photography. I, I lost all the time, and I did uh, pretty well. But anyway, I, I knew that it was tough to have a good match, and I like to have good matches. And my hopes were up because Mill, I think he missed his flight on purpose. We want to catch a later flight. Uh, I was set to do a singles match with Rick Fargo, who would have gladly put me over. So the idea is, just to catch everybody up, you're supposed to be working Mill Mascaris. You, you, you think, or Cornette thinks, when he breaks the news to you, you'd be thrilled. Right. But instead, when you don't get or he doesn't get some sort of enthusiastic response. He asks, what's wrong with that? And you just cut straight to it. And you say, Masker sucks, and the match is going to suck. <laughs> and then you ask, you know, as you explain, in my dealings, I found him to be selfish, redundant, and lousy. Those are your words in the book. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Jimmy, or you ask him, Jimmy, why is he coming in? And Cornette lets you know, ah, oh, it's just a couple shows in the Texas border towns. So it does feel like... As much as he's helped you out, he occasionally has given you some bad news, and this maybe he was all he he was sometimes given he was sometimes the bearer of bad news. Yeah. So I like in you know bringing Mill for uh, that's great to try to increase uh, the crowd a little bit, but in the end, you're taking a guy who you're trying to push, having lose to someone who's not going to be on again, somewhat akin to, to what I thought saw as a short sightedness of making the Omni in Atlanta the priority when Bill Watts came in to yes. turn the Omni into the Madison Square Garden of the South. And so you'd have guys cutting promos about the Omni on live national television, which to me made it look like a regional promotion. Yeah. Uh, but that was the, the on their list. The Omni was more important than those other aspects. And I guess in this case, building up that house in Corpus Christi was more important than the television product. Uh, so I, I, I realized that was quite For, a challenge. Forget all the company okay. stuff. From your perspective, your career is going pretty well here. Yeah. And now this is going to be my most watched match ever, and I'm going to be wrestling a guy who I know is going to make sure I look less than. Right. He's going to make sure he he did his hip tosses and he died. he was a great he was a great worker. He still I mean, in his day. Let, you know, got over everywhere he went, whether or not, whether, and he got over in places that it was not based on the Hispanic market. You know, he had a unique look, great body, uh, great looking mask, uh, Mil Mascaras, great name. Uh, but he was older and he didn't care about having good matches. And at that time, that was my priority. I wanted to have good matches and I didn't think I could have one with Mill. He probably wasn't the type of guy who was going to come over and say, what would you like to do tonight? No, yeah, not at all. Matter of fact, he only got there about 20 minutes before we went on. So when he's late to the building, they start to make backup plans, and yeah. that's when you think maybe you're going to be wrestling Fargo, right? Mm -hmm. Which would mean you're getting a win on the Clash of the Champions. Right, right. Drop that big elbow. Rare win because I was just coming off, you know, about 10 weeks. Uh, there was that interruption. Well, I actually didn't miss any TV time when I got the big car accident. Uh, about a hundred stitcheroonies in the in the foley body, bot, front teeth were knocked out, but did not miss any time. I'm proud of that. Didn't miss any matches, uh, but a, a win on TV would have been big. The nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing getting <laughs> stiff. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, we all know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom, especially when it's time to step up to the plate. And that's where Blue Chew comes in. We like to call it a hot tag for your wiener, daddy. Ow, have mercy. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the boing, cost. Boing, boing, boing. And you, <laughs> Action Jackson just took it off. <laughs> <laughs> and you can take them anytime, day or night. So you can be ready whenever a plan. Oh, shit. I don't know what we're doing. Guys, you know what to do. Go to bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. Once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you're missing out. The best part it's all done online. No awkward visits, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. The tablets are made right here in the USA, they're prepared and shipped directly to your door. Just like a couple of jumbo size baby oils. I'll get it. It's all in a discreet package, but there won't be anything discreet about your package, oh. Danny. <laughs> so if you can benefit, what are we doing? With extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Have better sex, y'all. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. 
when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your very first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, you wrote in your book that, and you actually downplay uh, on TV. And it was due to the fact that you had only signed a one year deal and yet hadn't been renewed. Um, talk me through that is the reason for this lack of great storyline because they weren't sure you were sticking around was the company struggling financially just behind the scenes what were you thinking was going to happen when this one-year deal was up say royal rumble time that surprises me to learn about the one-year deal because i thought everyone signed a five-year deal and i don't think i was in a position where i i don't know I, i i i know i wrote that there had to be something to it um I, it didn't occur to me that they were downplaying me because I understood, I always felt like you needed to ebb and flow. You can't that, stay hot forever. Yeah, and I understood that was part of the process. And I also understood that, you know, one thing that uh, drives me a little crazy about a lot of today's fans is they think if it's not for the title, it's not, right. it's not uh, consequential. And I grew up loving the feuds. Yes. So that uh, uh, Snuka Morocco was for the Intercontinental Championship, but it might as well not have been because it was all about pride. Yes. And so I grew up loving that. It was easier to have those uh, blood feuds when you had blood, right? It was easier to make, uh, you know, suspend disbelief that it was easier to be that that match that makes guys like me come into school and tell his buddies, okay, I know wrestling is what, you know, but hey, that was real. Yes. You wanted to be the guy that made people say that was real. And for me, never feeling like I was championship material to begin with. You know, I was tag team championship material, right? But I, I never set my sights on the title matches because I didn't think I had a spot there. I think I had a spot in losing title matches, but I I didn't I didn't base the importance of my match on whether or not there was a title attached to it. Even when you're in the main event for the title in a, in your house pay per view in October '96, you didn't consider if this goes well, maybe this is a trilogy, maybe there's you just knew. Well, I wish we you talk about this match with Sean. Yeah, in September. Yeah, man, I, yeah. I wish and we had very little storyline going into it. It was a promo or two, but basically... It was kind of rushed. It was kind of rushed, and Sean had been teaming up with Taker against me and Goldust at house show matches, and we'd been going around the loop with some really good matches, but Mind Games was the first time Sean and I ever squared off for singles of any kind, and it was the chemistry was... Magic. Immediate. Yeah, immediate. And I look back like, yeah, I wish there'd been more. I specifically wish there'd been a Mania match. Yeah. And I had worked myself into, I was still about 270 for that match, but I was, I had really worked myself into good shape, meaning cardio was strong and it wasn't a factor even in the back of my mind. And there's a segment in that match where I dropped the, uh, the like the flying headbutt, you know, uh, inspired by Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan's Tree of Woe, and my mask comes loose. And there's no panic at all. I'm just rocking back and forth. So I'm in character while I tie the mask. So I remember feeling that there was no panic. Uh, I was really confident in what I was going to do. And I wish I'd had that level of confidence on a bigger stage with with a more fully uh, realized angle. Uh, You're injured at the time, but you return in the run-up for SummerSlam 99. And somehow you and China get tangled up in a shot at the number one contendership <laughs> for the title held by Steve Austin. The storyline is that Hunter was getting ready for his shot at Austin. And on the night it's announced that governor Jesse Ventura will be the special guest referee. Well, Hunter is none too happy about it. So Michaels makes a match between Hunter Austin and Taker in the main event, but Austin takes or Hunter takes Austin out instead. And then Michaels puts China in the match. And now it's for Hunter shot at SummerSlam. I know maybe this is uh, a lot coming at you pretty fast, but the story here is China's moving up to be even mm-hmm. mentioned in the mix with those talent. Yeah, those are the A side. This is the marquee. This is the tippy top of the profession. Yeah, yeah, and I can't wait until uh, just a few minutes from now when we start talking about her work with Eddie Guerrero. 
phenomenal. Uh, but this is probably the time when I have the match with China. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the rattlesnake returns. He hits Hunter with a chair, puts China on top. China versus Austin is now scheduled to headline SummerSlam. That might be a little silly. I mean, even today, as modern as we are, I don't know that anybody would think it's going to be Becky Lynch and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. But you return to Raw the next week when China and Hunter are squaring off for the number one contendership. You help China get the win and retain her spot. And uh, you challenge China. She refuses and gives you a low blow. Uh, and you wrote in your book, China, we both know that there's always been a vague sexual tension oh, between us. Yeah. You with your revealing outfits and me, me with, with mine. mine. Yeah. So great. You know, just um, I, I mentioned something in uh, Have a Nice Day about how uh, China, China had touched my genitalia. I said, now given... The touch occurred when her hand was balled up in a fist, was traveling at high speeds, but it's my book and I'm going to count it. Yes. Uh, a very respected uh, journalist comes to my house to do a story for me on the New York Times. And she's, and I've got the poster up in the basement, the Reed poster with me, Joni, and, and Rock. And the, she's saying, I wish I could remember her name. She was really sweet. Uh, she goes, oh, so that's that's China, huh? I said, yeah. She goes, um, how does how does your wife feel about uh, this poster? Oh, we love her. The whole family loves her. At the same time, the woman believes that I've had some type of physical relationship. Wow! And it wasn't until she actually asked me, I went, Fiz- "No, no." Like she said, "But what about the touch?" I was, well, "That was a joke." You know, she punched me, <laughs> she punched me in the balls. <laughs> like that's not a relationship. Um, but. I do remember. I do remember that match being real, you know, tentative. Thinking she smelled, uh, she smelled incredible. Her skin was so smooth, almost like she'd been using one of our shaving products. Oh yeah, products. come on, oh, man. oh man, baby, smooth. Oh man, I love it. Love this. Um, what is the name of our Henson shaving? Henson shaving. Yeah, it was almost like she'd use Henson shaving. She smelled great. It was like wrestling a better smelling Bob Holly. I it love really you for was. That. And I do, you know, here's a question I have. Maybe our fans or listeners can uh, chime in. Joni, when she was still here, uh, traded me, I think, 10 photos of that match that she had autographed in return for 10 photos that I autographed so that she could sell those photos and that I could do the same. Um, But I still have them. I don't know what to do with them. I feel like people would like them. I'm trying to find a good uh, organization to make a donation to. So maybe our our fans can we'll come uh, up with something. Come up with something for that. This moment where uh, she uh, punches you in the wean, uh, you, you write, as I slump to the canvas in an awkward fetal position, does that mean no? I managed to gasp <laughs> out. And even from a distance, I could see China laugh as she stepped back through the curtain. <laughs> we did have a match, and it was strange because as well as I knew her, and as helpful as I'd been to her career by letting her get physically involved, I did feel strange about having a match with her. Yeah, she and Hunter had just torn into each other only minutes earlier, but I really didn't know what to do. So I did what came naturally. I stuck up the place and I put Mr. Sacco on her. Yeah. I love that. It was a good experience, but I did not I did not know what to do. And I wasn't comfortable with the idea of forearms or anything of that nature. Right. Was that um was that ever discussed? I mean it's important to remember this is a television show. Yeah. You do have to make the station happy. You don't want to offend advertisers. Um, but it's an interesting character. It's an interesting set of circumstances. It's not your yeah. traditional man-on-woman, quote-unquote, violence. And the thing is, I mean. did have experience wrestling women. Uh, one of the posts that I spent a long time writing, which you know is not going to get as, as many looks, uh, and I also, uh, I wrote it originally as a feature for Bell to Bells, so they could have the exclusive on it. But it was about my time uh, training at Mark Tendler's garage with Susan Sexton, who is a really great technician and worked strong style before there was a name for it. Like, she was no nonsense. She wasn't a flyer, uh, but she was a good technician. When I wrote about her, Regal got back to me and he said, oh, her reputation among the, the, the men and women in the U.K. was 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 super high and so i did i'd spend hours and upon hours working with her and never gave her the credit she deserved certainly not in have a nice day it wasn't until dozens of years went back i was like wow 
maybe that's why I have so much respect for women's wrestling because I was working regularly with one of the most respected women of her era. Um, so I did have some experience, but it had, it had been so many years earlier. That had been 15 years earlier, I think, 12, 13 years earlier. And I did not know what to do. Chris Adams, one of those maybe forgotten names to wrestling history. I don't think enough people talk about him enough. Wow. The innovator of the super kick. And he was the first yeah. with the super kick in wrestling, right? Yeah. And I work with Chris. Uh, I, I talked about this in my, my first book is that, um, and we'll get back to Steve, I promise you, but I don't, I think it's safe to say without a Chris Adams, we don't have a Steve Austin well said. as we know him. Because he didn't just learn to wrestle from Chris, he learned how to do a program. Do a program, and that's really important. So, uh, Bill Watts, this is another little economics wrestling 101 lesson, and we talked about it a little bit in the Watts episode. Watts's success was based on the uh, the oil boom towns that he ran. And when the oil business was down in the late 80s, uh, before they sold to WCW, uh, they thought the best way to stay alive was to expand into the parts of the country where his TV was strong, Watts's TV, but uh, that they had not traditionally hit. And that's where they started doing Ohio, West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, oh, yeah, we talked about that in regards to the Sam Houston story I, yes. I told last week. Um, and it was, so the first time Chris Adams was on the shows with, uh, with Terry Taylor, uh, Shane Douglas and I uh, drove them all around for a week, you know, soaked in every bit of information we possibly could. And so the next time they came back, about two months later, I'm thinking March or April of 1986, uh, or March of April of... No, I think the first time was February, uh, November 86, and they came back in like February 87. I had a match with Adams, uh, 1,500 people in Ohio uh, high school gymnasium. And he just said, you know, we'll call it out there. I'm not going to do the English accent because I do, don't, don't do one well. And he had a distinctive type of uh, British accent. It's not a one, to, one size fits all for UK accents as far as and our UK fans know that. And when I was in that ring, Conrad, I just listened to everything he said and more importantly, listened to the fans. I'd never been a part of an atmosphere like that where fans were just hankering for Chris to come back. And now these days, a rear chin lock's not going to get the type of reaction it did in 87. But uh, man, I'd never been a part of something like that. So that when Chris finally hit me with that super kick, it was the biggest response that I'd ever been a part of, largely because he had built me up to be someone so that when he super kicked me, he had beaten someone. So I owe a lot to Chris. Yeah. I really do for taking, you know, in a way, kind of taking me under his wing. And he continued to do that when I was in world class. And you're right. He is a guy that has largely been forgotten and probably not enough credit is given to him. When we think about the super kick too, it, it was really a, a special move, a magic move, not only for Chris, but with Shawn Michaels. And then it became kind of commonplace. Everybody yeah. started to do it. And, and I think of it maybe like a DDT. I mean, when Jake did it, that was the end. Brother, that's the end. Hey, when I was in world class, uh, P.Y. Chuhai, <laughs> also known as Phil Hickerson, one of the things I love about wrestling is that when Phil Hickerson went, he think he only did one tour of Japan. Phil was this rugged, kind of mountain man looking yeah, guy. Yeah. And he was over because he was a long time heel who turned baby face. You couldn't deny his, you know, his uh, his skills, you know, and his, uh, in a weird way, his likability. When he went to Japan and came back as P.Y. Chuhai, it was supposed to get heat because he clearly was supposed to be have ad adapted or adopted uh parts of the japanese culture right when he came to world class they tried to put him off like he was a i remember mark Lawrence. look at this giant oriental it's like he's phil hickerson with a little makeup on his eye you know like <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless he uh he he has a he had a great run and i don't know if i talked about this in my book and i know this is about to be supposed to be about steve 
uh, and I'll be hard pressed to even tell you where my Phil Hickerson story is supposed to go. Oh, I know what it was. The the the, the Eric Embry, uh, you are my hero. Just put it on reserve. We'll talk about it some other time. And how how I helped. That was the first video that I did for World Class that I helped video Bob Von Gersky produce. Uh, now that I'm there, I might as well just say like neither one of us realized that. In the video, which would be seen by hundreds of thousands of people, you can clearly see Eric Embry's blizzard <laughs> pirouetting in slow motion <laughs> through the air, and it was an error. He dr dropped his dropped his gimmick, and I uh, did not catch that even in super slow motion. But Phil Hickerson uh, gave a guy a, um, a DDT, and the guy sold it for the finish, but got up quicker than he should have because he had a girl waiting for him out in the parking lot and did not want to look weak. And brother, the fight that went on backstage, you know, was, uh, it was, uh, it was unsettling. And it was because this guy had not sold the DDT properly. Now the proper way to sell a DDT off the top rope is to be up and at 100%, you know, uh, less than a minute later. Right. Less than a minute later. So I, I, I am straddling that line of the old school that really believes that every mat move should be properly sold uh, in the new school, which, you know, necessitates you have to do more to get the consumer interested. But there are a few moves that need to be respected. Pile driver, I would think, is the first one. Uh, and uh, close behind the DDT. You didn't get up from a DDT back in their day, brother. Well, what happens is, Coachman comes out, announces it's going to be Cena and Lashley versus Booker and Orton as the main event. And Foley and Umaga, because Vince didn't like Foley and he admired Umaga. And here we go. Uh, Meltzer would say this. Foley versus Umaga was supposed to be Foley's first singles match on Raw in seven years, but it technically never got started. They brawled outside the ring. Foley clocked Umaga with a chair shot to the head, which Umaga barely sold. Umaga then super kicked the chair into Foley's face and did the running hip attack to Foley, knocking his head into the ring steps. And Foley sold the KO, and they had the ref call it off before it even started. This was one of those educational knockout endings with Foley being all glassy eyed. To me, it doesn't make sense to do that to a guy who was in line for a title main event on the final show before the pay per view to lay out a babyface challenger by someone who isn't even a participant in the title match. That is, unless Umaga will somehow play a part in Foley's story at the pay-per-view, I guess we'll see. But at the moment, it sure did come off strange, particularly because the first thing you did was question whether or not Foley would be injured and out of the match. It was addressed later with Lawler saying that he expected Foley would be there, but no definitive word was given before the show went off the air. Let's We'll talk about the silliness of the booking uh, in a minute. Yeah. So umaga gone way too soon another super yeah. talented performer we have to talk about in past tense what do you think of working with umaga well i it wasn't that i minded working with him i minded working with him that close to the show in something that didn't benefit the main event at all that now that match would not have counted towards my three that was kind of like a I bonus think. thing i don't you know what i would go through these phases where like you gotta you know figure out which hills you're going to die on, be willing to die on. The Omaga match was not one that I was willing to die on. The Vince uh, angle where he was blown up, that was one that I would, uh, uh, it's a hill I was willing to climb and die on because I just felt really strongly about that. So if you're going to, you can't come in with two arguments. You've got to keep it, I guess technically you can. I just feel for the more effective argument, you keep it limited to one, which is this, you know, which I thought was like a tasteless and confusing angle that uh, had led a decent portion of our audience to believe that Mr. McMahon had died. And I just didn't think that was territory we should be crossing with our show. We're supposed to take people's minds off their problems. I guess in some ways we do create new problems by having our characters who they have uh, you know, uh, emotional investments in get themselves in situations, but you know, you love that. You love to watch a good TV show. I think that's different than feeling and being led to believe through really believable pyrotechnics that uh, the owner of WWE has perished. So I just, um, I was more concerned with that 
And I was, I, I did not like the idea that, you know, I, I lost this match so quickly, uh, only because it had nothing to do with it, only because it not only did it have nothing to do with the main event match, but that it hurt, it, um, it hurt the match in the sense that it gave fans even less of an idea that I had a chance to win that thing. And I think when you get out there in the best case scenario, it's like any man can win at any time. And we've just seen one of the participants squashed, as uh, Meltzer said, first raw match in seven years. Uh, not a great way to make a statement. Unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, again, the date is March 16th, 1994. We're going to do a whole episode on Vader, I'm sure, sometime. But this is not your first Vader match. No. I mean, this is probably match 100 or more. I mean, you had no telling how many matches with him. Did you guys have, like, a standard match? Well, we've often heard, you know, from, from other folks who would say, and I think Jim Ross even tells a story on his podcast, that he once heard Jack Briscoe and Harley Race talking about a match. Maybe it was Dory and Harley. But as they're getting dressed, they said, you know, something like, should we do Chicago or New Orleans? Because they both knew, all right, this is the type of match we yeah, do there. Yeah, and yeah. Did you have a routine like that with Vader? The routine was Leon beats the hell out of me. And I, <laughs> I fight for my life. For real. That's what it felt like. Leon called real, real very realistic uh, match as the heel. And he was free. He, I wrote this in Leon's uh, uh, book. Underrated book, by the way. They did a good it is, job. Yeah, the book. guy did a good job, and I told him, wow, man, you must have really hung in there because Leon, uh, you know, not, Leon could be a, a handful. Um, grumpy every now and again. He could be grumpy, yeah, he could be grumpy. And so I thought the writer uh, did, a really, did a really good job in working with Leon, and they caught him at that time period where he only had the two months, two years, sorry, two years to live. And by the time the book came out, Leon wasn't with us anymore. Um, so I wouldn't say that we had a match. There was a pattern to the match, which is he's going to basically, I, I have to try eventually to knock down this impenetrable wall. Right. So I said in the, um, in the forward that, uh, man, nobody was a more convincing wall. And you could knock it down piece by piece if you were willing to work for it. And if you weren't, he was going to shut you down and eat you up. So it really forced me, because I'm not a naturally aggressive person, to turn that up a couple notches and uh, fight from underneath. And then when the time was right, Leon would take bumps for me. And uh, I loved working with him. I considered it like my Fraser Ali especially when I did not think that I would ever reach heights. You know, I did not think there'd be a WWE run. Uh, you felt I, this is as good as it yeah, gets. Yeah, and I, and I felt like when I was in uh, my big pay-per-view main event with him in October 93, I could tell by the way the show had been written uh, moving forward that I wasn't part of the mix. So I like, uh, here's my last hurrah. So uh, when I was in New Orleans doing my show, I talked about how... I took, you know, I was, I was uh, you know, near the crowd by the guardrail and back in the days before cell phone cameras took somebody's very real camera and used it on Leon. And, you know, when you use something like that up close, you got to bring it. So that thing was in pieces when I handed it back. Probably not the happiest guy in the world. I just ruined his quality camera. But then I turned, I wheeled around like this just with my head and scanned the crowd. And as I did that, section by section got on their feet and came alive. And I remember thinking, this is the height of my career, but also the lowest point of my career because I will never reach this height again. That's the way I was thinking in that match. So I never thought that, I always felt in a way like the angle was booked to fail or at least booked not to succeed because he was already in the next program with Sid. There yeah. was no intangibles out there, but what if they tear the house down? Um, and we had that horrible build, which was the uh, Lost in Cleveland. <laughs> so so they uh, Eric Bischoff mercifully pulled the plug on that like eight eight weeks into a 12-week uh, run, and then they just had me come out, and I acted like it had all been a swerve to, uh, you know, to to get inside Leon's head, and we ended up having a great match. 
Uh, I ended up, that's where I took the, the bump on his back, which was specifically designed to end my career. And I remember being so disappointed that it hadn't. And at the time, My Lloyds of London was not, it wasn't like a major uh, windfall. It may have seemed like, it would have been like what I made for a year and a half. But I was so frustrated by the whole process that I did want out. I did want out of What the, was your backup plan? Uh, I don't know if I had one at that time. You know, we were living pretty frugally. We had a nice little house, but it was, you know, nothing special. I don't know that I had a backup plan, Conrad. You were just frustrated in that moment. I was just so frustrated that this business that I had, you know, given so much to, uh, in some ways that had allowed me to live out my dreams, wasn't loving me back like I, like I thought it should. Mystery,